Hello everyone and welcome to my presentation on the extended parallel process model. I just want to first wish and hope that you all are doing very well and are staying safe and healthy amidst this crisis. Um, but yeah, so as you can tell, I'm going to be doing this model. So without further ado, let's get started. So what is the extended parallel process model? So the model can be best described as the dual process in which a receiver does something in response to a fear appeal that is being aroused within them. And this was quoted from Dr. Lucy Popova. So the study developed when by Dr. Kim White, and Dr. Kim White developed this model when she was an assistant professor of speech communications at Texas A&M University. Now she's a professor in the Department of Communication at Michigan State University, and her current research focuses on the development of effective health risk messages for members of diverse cultures. So the first part that I'm going to be talking about with this extended parallel process model is how it aims to explain how a receiver responds to a fear appeal. So when it comes to a fear appeal, a uh, receiver, when it comes to the messages, can respond in two ways. So the two ways are danger control or fear controls, and these are only specified when a message specifically triggers something in them. So danger control is more constructive, meaning that there is going to be an initial plan, there's a step-by-step -step process which a person goes about the solution to the problem and really focuses on the solution. Um, and with that being said, the personality or the emphasis or emotion that a person may feel when they're being triggered with their danger control action is proactiveness, calmness, and awareness. However, on the opposite hand, you'll see fear control, which is more spontaneous, more counterproductive to the initial problem at hand or to the initial fear appeal that is being presented. Um, and it generally focuses on focuses on the problem, so it's more emotion-based as well. So the emotion that a person may feel when it comes to fear control can involve denial, avoidance, or panic. So let's go with the assumption. Uh, let's go with the assumption on COVID-19, which is the recent epidemic, which ironically works really, really well with this presentation. So COVID-19 is dangerous and can kill people if you do not stay home with social distance and wash your hands. That is the fear appeal. The fear appeal is that COVID-19 is dangerous and can kill people. Now, with that being said, there are two danger controls that can happen with these. So when a person hears this message and they have their trigger con danger control triggered, they can stay home and only go out if necessary. So work or essential shopping, they'll social distance and they'll wash their hands and practice good health practices. However, if this message triggers someone's fear control, they're going to worry about getting sick when they're not actually sick, or they might not take it as seriously, meaning they're not going to social distance, they're going to stay home and go to areas that they're not supposed to, or travel if they're not supposed to, and or they can overprotect themselves or others, meaning that they'll either do things that are not necessary, or they'll try to isolate themselves, and that also isn't necessary as well. So the second part to explaining the extended parallel process model is that it aims to explain the effectiveness and efficacy of the responses given from th these fear appeals. So effectiveness in this sense is described as the strength that the receiver's response is the proper way to go about a problem or fear, and efficacy is the strength that the receiver's response will be fully carried out in response to the problem or fear. So with that being said, too, when it comes to effectiveness and efficacy, um, it depends on how these are portrayed or the levels of effectiveness and efficacy displayed when each danger or fear control is taken over. So in order for danger control to be taken over, it is solely based on the person's perception, just like in fear control. So in order for danger control to take over, the person must think an effective response is available, which is response efficacy, and that they are capable of undertaking that response, which is self-efficacy. Now, if the person thinks that there is no solution available or that they simply cannot carry out the solution, then fear control will take over. It is essential that both of the response efficacy and self-efficacy is present because there is a high correlation in response to them it, or because if there is a low representation of either one, then fear control will absolutely take over. With efficacy, the effect of the effectiveness of the vital or actual 
effectiveness to the efficacy is perceived by perceived efficacy. So perceived efficacy has to do with whether a receiver thinks a recommended action is both effective and practical to avoid the harm portrayed by the fear appeal. So if the fear appeal of convinces someone that the solutions work, then they are more likely to use them, which is high perceived efficacy. However, if the fear appeal leaves someone worrying that the solutions are unreliable or impractical, then they'll be less likely to use them, which is low perceived efficacy. Now let's go back to the example with COVID-19 with the assumption and the premises that we've created. So the assumption that we stated was COVID-19 is dangerous and can kill people if you do not stay home, social distance, and wash your hands. If a person believes that these solutions to the epidemic is practical and efficient, then they're more likely to use it, which practices high perceived efficacy. However, if a person believes that the solutions, which is not, which is staying at home, staying at home, social distance, and washing your hands, is impractical and inefficient, then they're less likely to use it, which is low perceived efficacy. Now. All of these come back to fear appeals. So fear appeals are really, really powerful in the essence that it can be an effective way to persuade someone into a certain opinion or a certain product or anything really that you're trying to persuade someone into. So fear appeals. So you have to use appeals that have a practical and effective solution, which will then trigger the danger control method. When a persuader has these practical and effective solutions available at hand, they're more the person that they're trying to persuade is more likely to take the solutions or the side that they're considering or being persuaded on and create constructive responses to them. However, a lot of the challenges of using fear appeals is that you should try to avoid appeals that are non-efficacious because they will trigger fear control, which produces counterproductive responses. So these counterproductive responses, like I mentioned, could be worrying, denial, avoidance, or anything that just really negates the person from focusing on the solutions that can be taken on or proactive, um, but instead focuses solely on the problem itself. So the factors that can affect fear appeal success is one, perceived vulnerability, which is the ability or the likelihood that the audience will be able to be persuaded into the message or persuaded into believing the information that is provided for them. The second is the specificity of the recommendations, meaning the solutions that are available, how the details that are going into it, how, when, why, what is the purpose behind these solutions, and number three, which is the positioning of these recommendations. So the positioning meaning like if it's going to support a certain movement or a certain idea or philosophy or if it doesn't support a certain idea or philosophy. And when all three of these things are considered, the message is adapted accordingly to the audience and promotes success and persuasion. However, if you're going to be using fear appeals within your persuasion or within your argument, you must practice extreme caution because this can be highly unethical in some people knowing that they're using someone's fears as a way to promote their side or to negate them into that side because it might seem as abrasive or it might seem as extrusion uh, in some way, so you must practice, practice extreme caution. So an experiment that I saw on this that was actually mentioned in the Gas Insider book was the self-efficacy on condom usage on college students. So this all-in-all -all experiment was a study done on Chinese college students where they measured the percentage of students who were self-efficate on using condoms after being presented the dangers of not using them, which back then was contributing to the message or the awareness of HIV and AIDS. So with that being said, the result with the higher the level of perceived efficacy, the higher the level of self-efficacy will be, meaning that when these students saw the solutions that were provided when you use condoms um, is higher for the level of self-efficacy, which means that the more likely they're going to be using condoms in response to the solutions presented. So the questions I have for you all are what certain fears causes your thought process to trigger danger control or fear control? I know for me, certain fears that causes my thought process to trigger danger control will be if there is a certain test coming up and I have to figure out ways on how I can go about studying for the test, which is, again, studying, looking over notes, or talking to other people or co-peers in my class about certain things that I don't understand, or even emailing my teacher. And when it comes to fear control, certain fears that can cause me to worry about that is 
like accidents or if someone's sick, you know, things that don't really happen quite as often, I feel, would cause fear control. Um, and then the second question is, are you able to keep yourself accountable by responding to the fears properly by yourself or do you need people to remind you? A lot of the things that comes with extended parallel process theory is keeping yourself accountable and really being self-efficate, but sometimes it's really hard to be accountable, especially if people are really busy and have a lot going on. So sometimes I also feel that I need to have the reminder. So I'm really, really curious as to the answers you guys have for this for the discussion, for the questions. I'm really also excited to see the responses you guys have, and I really hope you guys have an awesome day. Thank you for listening to my presentation.